Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 3rd of December, 2017. <laughs> Just making sure I get everything right. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about order of operations when you are processing your dialogue audio clips in post. Now, this is going to refer primarily to just working on an individual clip. Uh, mixing is another matter altogether. I'll talk about it a little bit as it relates to this, but uh, this is mainly talking about looking at an individual clip. First of all, also, this is my, this is the approach I'm taking right now. I am not here to suggest that I am the ultimate authority on this, <laughs> that um, this is how I'm doing it. However, one thing I can say, I think with fair a bit of confidence, is that in most of the digital audio workstation applications we're using today, the audio processing is done in 32-bit float or greater. So that's going to apply to Audition. That refers, of course, to Pro Tools, Logic, Studio One. Um, prob well, I haven't double-checked, but I'm pretty sure GarageBand as well. Even Audacity does 32-bit float uh, processing. So... What that means in practical terms is that there are very few circumstances where you're going to really kind of get yourself wrapped around an axle or sideways or whatever, or however you want to say it, um, or, or degrade the quality of your audio by doing one thing before another. Now, that's only in terms of the actual digital processing. There are some things that you want to do in a certain order in terms of uh, to, to ensure that you optimize the sound the way you want to. So let's just talk about each of those and uh, or just kind of talk about the order in which I generally process things and why. If you have suggestions or you've been doing some audio processing and you you think you found a better way, that's great. Share it. We would love to. We would all love to hear it, I'm sure. So first of all, um, a, some, some, I, I don't know how other people find this, but sometimes I'm finding, in fact, a lot of times I'm finding that male voice on a variety of microphones the waveforms are asymmetric. That is to say that the top end of the um, the waveform is actually has a greater amplitude than the bottom, or vice versa, one of the two. Um, so if that's the case, generally my very first step is to do uh, what's called phase rotation. So in um, RX, advanced, in the phase tool, there is something called adaptive phase rotation. And what that does is that evens it up. It doesn't change the sound of the audio. It just makes it so that the waveforms are more even around the center line, which just gives you more headroom. And that's the main reason I do it, is to give myself a little bit more headroom so that when we do get to the point where I need to adjust the overall loudness, I have a little bit more freedom because I have more headroom. So that's the main purpose there. And what I mean by freedom is that that means I can actually increase the loudness more without digitally clipping without hitting the zero dB mark and, and, and resulting in um, any sort of distortion. So that's the first step I typically do. Then I generally will, depending on how the, the level of the audio, I'll generally get it up to, I'll generally normalize it to somewhere around minus 20, between minus 28 and minus 24 LUFS. And that's just so that I can actually see the waveform and I can see the... Um, Spec in the spectral analysis view, I can actually see what's going on very clearly. So that just makes it easier for me to work with. And again, because we're working in 32-bit float for the most part, that's not going to be an issue. Um, some people will kind of freak out and say, well, shouldn't you do noise reduction first? Well, kind of doesn't really matter with 32-bit float processing. You can if you want to. This is just how I've been doing it because I like to be able to see... Um, and hear what's going on before I start doing these types of things like noise reduction. So after that, um, I'll typically use a high pass filter if it's required or if it's needed, it can help. And I, I like to use a linear phase equalizer to do that or a linear phase high pass filter. The reason I say that what a linear phase one does is that when it does its processing, when it say, for example, reduces the amount of very low frequency sound, it doesn't mess up the phase of the waveform again. That is to say, it doesn't make it asymmetric again. So that's the main idea there. RX has one, um, and there are others, third-party ones out on the market. Those built into Audition are not phase linear phase, but, um, you know, again, I'm just telling you how I do it. I'm not saying it's the right way or the only way. It's, it's just generally how I do it to kind of, kind of keep the process quick for me and, and what, what works for me. So the idea of a high-pass filter is to reduce any sort of low-frequency rumble, if there is any. Um, also, if there is any sort of energy down there, 
even if it wasn't something that was there on location, it may have been due to the movement of the boom pole um, so that the capsule picked up some movement. Um, all those sorts of things generally below 100 hertz can occur. And what I'm trying to do there is just eliminate that. That can actually cause problems on playback. Uh, depending on the system, the playback system, speakers, amplifier, whatever that your audience is using, that can actually affect the sound overall. It can actually mess with some of the other frequencies um, and interact in ways that are not helpful. So for me, it's generally good to get that out of the way. And generally, you're not going to be affecting anyone's dialogue, timbre, or anything like that. There are very few men's voices that even dip below 100 or maybe down to 80. Um, but even so, it's generally not going to, to drastically change the way that audio sounds. So generally, I'm applying a high-pass filter somewhere around 70 hertz spot noise reduction. So if there are individual discontinuous sounds, like, for example, a doorbell or a cell phone ringing or, you know, something, a door squeaking, whatever it is, and you don't want it in there, those are the things to remove first. And uh, an episode we had a couple of weeks ago, we, we kind of demonstrated how to do that, so I'll put a link for that. Then I do my broadband noise reduction. This is using the noise reduction plugins to generally reduce noise. And in my case, again, I'm generally using the, the noise reduction, the dialogue noise reduction in Isotope RX, which works beautifully and is very easy to use. I generally will do some sort of compression. And the compression that I'm doing here is really just to manage these little transient spikes that go up and right back down very quickly. Those are just robbing you of headroom. That's not something that people can generally hear anyway. So really all I'm trying to do is manage those, again, to give me more headroom so that at the end of the piece, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here, I can loudness normalize the whole thing. So that's the next thing. After I've done the compression, this is where you start to do the things that sweeten the sound from my experience. So you want to do the compression first because if you have to get a little bit aggressive with the compression, you actually will change the timbre of the audio. Um, if you're lucky enough that you only have to really kind of pull those transient peaks in, you generally won't change the timbre all that much. But if you do have to get more aggressive, then you will. And that's why I save the sweetening for after the compression. So the first thing I'll generally do is any sort of de-essing that's required. Um, then I will generally do any sort of equalization that I want to use for sweetening the overall sound. And generally that's, I don't do a ton of that. But if I do need to do some of that, that's when I'll do it. Typically what I'll be doing there is more cuts than boosts. If you find yourself doing a lot of boosts, um, there might be other things that you can do that will make this all easier for you. It may be recording technique, microphone placement, other things of that nature. Um, or maybe your microphone just isn't well suited for the purpose you're using it. Whatever it may be, um, that's just kind of my take on equalization for sweetening. I will generally... Um, do that. Now, once you get into cinema and you're mixing lots of other sounds, you can get a little bit more aggressive on the EQ. But again, still, it's mostly going to be cuts and not so much um, boosts, in my experience. After that, I'll generally do a debreathing run. And what I use for that is uh, Isotopes. Nectar has a very nice debreathing um, plugin that works great. And literally, it's a matter of just running through it once. I have some my kind of default setting is 75% sensitivity, I think, is the setting, and the other one is a minus 9.5 dB, um, is how much it applies to whenever it finds a breath, it reduces it by 9.5 decibels. Works really, really nicely in most cases. Now, I should take a step back here and, and just describe that. If I'm mixing a film here, I probably would not have done all of this stuff on this individual audio clip until after I've done kind of a general mix. And then I'll come back and go into Isotope and kind of fix each of these individual clips that need help, that need work. And then once I've done that, um, I go back and finalize the mix, make sure all the levels of the different clips are kind of in line with each other so that, and I don't mean that in a literal sense, but you, this is where you use your ears um, to make sure that they sound right. They sit together nicely. And then once I've done all that, then I come back and do, I, I actually render out the mix, and then I come back and do loudness normalization on the entire mix. I have had some questions come up about, well, when do I loudness normalize? And the answer is you do it at the very end. So once you've got your mix finalized, then you render the mix, and then you do the loudness normalization from there is my recommendation. The reason you don't do it before then is that 
is say for example you did some and then you did some mixing the problem is is once you've done that mixing now you've thrown the loudness all off again so if you're trying to hit a standard or a target of some sort then you're going to have to do it over again anyway so <laughs> i think it's important to get the mix sounding right and then to do the loudness normalization at the end so i hope that made sense i hope that was helpful for you if you have any questions go ahead and leave those down below let's have it let's get a good conversation going Hope you are having a good time making some good recordings. Get out there and make some more. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.